is something that should be absolutely standard across the board. Everybody should be having this education. The amount of people I meet are who are really intelligent and really well educated. They've just had nothing in this area or they've got the wrong thing. But rather than just operating or just pulling teeth out, it's like, well, what can we be doing to allow the growth of this child to develop better? And where can we notice a bit earlier what we can do rather than just waiting or, or pulling things out? We shouldn't need to do braces for children. So many people say, oh, yeah, but I've got a deviated septum, so, and I'm like, one, you don't know why. Two, you don't know like that, that isn't necessarily important unless it's really severe. Just because they've got damage to their lungs doesn't mean they can't be breathing better than they are. We're not expecting you to be breathing optimally, but for what you've got, you should be breathing optimally. This upper chest breath, and maybe even like, out through the mouth on the way out. We have seen this everywhere. This is in cartoons, films, everybody is passing on this sort of knowledge that isn't really knowledge at all. This is not how it should be. As a chiropractor, I thought I knew a lot about breathing until I met Jane. Jane is really an expert in breathing and she helps people to overcome different conditions from breathing to non-breathing conditions because of how breathing impacts the entire body. And she also helps people to optimize their performance through breathing better. And so this is exactly what we speak about. And most importantly, she gives some really, really helpful tools to get you started to breathing better, to overcome certain issues you may be having and just to help you to perform more optimally. Let's get straight into it. Jane, if someone was going to implement everything that we're about to talk about, knowing obviously what the types of things we're about to talk about, what kind of changes would you expect to see in their life based on people you've seen in the past? Well, um, it depends because we're looking at breathing habit changes. So we're looking at what humans in general would do. And a lot of us struggle in different ways. So some of us might be having panic attacks or feeling anxious. Some might be feeling stressed. Some might be snoring or mouth breathing, tiredness in the morning, these sorts of things. Um, some might be feeling a more breathless or struggling with sport, struggling to push as long as they want to. Um, so it can be a range of things that people are experiencing that it would help with. But still, the system of how to improve it is pretty, pretty static. It, it, it works well for everybody. So we're all looking to get back to optimal breathing habits. But because everybody can sort of deteriorate or degrade in different ways, it can show up differently as well. So we're, those are the kind of list of things we'd be looking at improving. But it's everybody will be different depending on how they're breathing currently. Yeah. So depending on, I suppose, how badly you're breathing and then what conditions are presenting as a result of that or they depend on then the results you can get. Do you think this is also for people that don't have any known issues? Yeah, so so I really work with sort of, well, two to three different types of person and that will actually do the work, should we say. One type is those who are struggling. So those who are, you know, they're snoring, but they're snoring and now they're kicked out onto the couch or they're, you know, being told off too many times or they want to be able to share their bedroom with their partner on holiday, that sort of thing, where it's, it's enough of a problem that it's not just normalized um, societal snoring. It's it's actually a problem in their lives. So they will actually do the work. Those who haven't got a pain point around snoring or don't really think it's that bad they generally don't do the work. And it, it, this is the big difference between the two. They both should, maybe, um, potentially, but it's more a case of, uh, you know, that person who's struggling will. And the same with panic attacks, anxiety, high stress, you know, poor energy levels. If somebody's bad enough, they will be like, I'm so up for it. Let's let's go because I'm just looking for something that's going to make the difference. And then they realize having recognized their own breathing habits as an issue, then they then they go for it. The other side are optimizers. So this will be like your professional athletes, biohackers, people who want to get themselves to the top level they can, um, as well as those who are maybe just a little bit more curious and interested. So someone like yourself, maybe, you know, you, you know, as a chiropractor, you've got a certain level of knowledge about the body, but there's still gaps in knowledge that we're all looking for. So it's that bit of going, actually, I didn't know I could optimize that bit. Let's go and try it. And you might go to 
a certain point, um, you might not go as far as like a professional athlete, for example, but you might want to at least improve your nighttime sleeping, your daytime breathing, um, your habits around it, just to say you can kind of get those incremental gains. And then the third part are usually those who do it for their kids. And it's not for themselves, although they need it, <laughs> although they are stressed, although they don't breathe well, although they are mouth breathing or whatever it is that they're doing. So many people just don't put themselves first or don't think that they, you know, are struggling as much as they are maybe. And so they'll only do it because they've got a mouth breathing child or a snoring child or a child with sleep apnea. And then they want to try and help. But it's some people still don't know that that's even an issue. They don't know that it impacts the development of a child's face and airway, depending on how they're breathing. So this is a kind of educational piece where parents sometimes get involved for that reason. Yeah. So it depends on the motivator. And that makes a lot of sense. And I can completely uh, relate to that within chiropractic. I mean, 95, 98 percent of people that come to see us is because they got pain. And the worse the pain, the more motivated they are. So that, that makes absolute sense. And uh, for me, I'm definitely the type of I'm definitely the type of person that wants to optimize. I get a lot of satisfaction in finding different ways of optimizing different things, not just health, but but other things as well. So, um, yeah, and so these types of things I I really enjoy because I'm like, well, what is my body actually capable of? I I know where I am here, and maybe if I if I get to here, there'll be something else that that I can experience that I'll be like, wow, why didn't I do that? Uh, in the first place i think so many of us though are not um we're not taught to think that of our bodies we're not taught to be empowered in our bodies we're taught through culture to go to a doctor or you know when you're in pain then you will go to a chiropractor or a physio or a someone to sort of fix you um in inverted commas it, you know this concept of that we don't have any ability over our own body is quite ingrained in society i think so many people will not look to optimize they'll just assume that they are optimal because they're young and then they deteriorate but actually that's not always the case yes and i think the most the most frustrating thing that i hear is oh it's just down to age i'm like no it's not <laughs> it's <laughs> down to habits yeah exactly exactly a long time of poor habits will look worse than a short time of poor habits exactly and and it's the same with um investment uh the, the or, or putting money into your pension the sooner you start the bigger your pot is at the end of of your life so was there an experience or some type of epiphany that you had in your early years that has brought you to what you do now yes <laughs> there always is isn't there um for me, you know, I'm really, really passionate about the subject, you know, breathing retraining, healthy, optimal breathing habits. This is, it, it, it's the kind of the newest thing within breathing. It's, it's not really as well known as it should be. This is something that should be absolutely standard across the board. Everybody should be having this education. And yet, you know, the amount of people I meet are who are um, really intelligent and really well educated in most areas are they've just had nothing in this area or they've got the wrong thing, for example. For me, it started when I was seven. And so I still remember sort of sitting on the floor in my bedroom. And I know that, you know, back in the day, you know, we didn't have iPads and we just sort of, we just, we were a bit bored. <laughs> we had moments to sit and notice our bodies. And I noticed that I was breathing through my mouth and I sort of tried to breathe through my nose. And I was like, I can breathe through it, but it, it feels a bit too small. Like it's not quite enough air is, is how it feels. And I was like, but surely if that was a problem, someone would have told me. And you know how you have those moments in life where you sort of memory bank them, but you don't know why. This was one of those ones where I memory banked and I didn't know why. And what really interested me about this particular moment was the fact that I had such trust in parents, doctors, dentists, orthodontists, you know, anyone that I would come across, teachers, etc. I'd never Googled, even when that became a thing in the future. Um, so when I was a teenager, that would have been possible. I never Googled, I never really asked about my breathing. And I knew that my nose felt too small, but because no one had said that mouth breathing was a problem, because no one had said that how you breathe matters, because no one had empowered me around using my breath for anything. I just never asked the question. And that really, really makes me feel like 
that's why I'm so passionate now. Because how many people have got to the, whatever the age they are now and they think, well, surely if it was, if, surely if it was important, someone would have told me, why should I listen to you now? I'm 50, you know? And I think that's scary that we just, we have absolutely no idea this is important. So when I found out around 30, I think I was about 30, I found out from a podcast, literally a random podcast. I'd had my daughter. I you know, spent a lot of time breastfeeding thinking, okay, I could probably be doing something a bit more productive with my time after I'd gone through the, you know, the cooey phase. I'd be like, I'm going to be here for a good half an hour, an hour, quite, quite a lot. So I started listening to podcasts, I started listening to health podcasts. And then I was like, this is incredible. I've just, I've just learned that one, mouth breathing is a problem. And two, I can actually retrain my nose and I can do something about this. And I was just like, bing, like I've been wondering about this since I was seven, you know, but I still kept coming back to that. But surely if it was a problem, someone would have told me. And I realized that having been somebody who in the past maybe did feel a little disempowered and did think, well, what change can I make in the world? It's only me you know, even with the best education, you know, what can I really do? This was a chance for me to go, actually, it's not complicated to teach basic education. We just need to actually do it. And you've got to be committed enough to do it. And you've got to learn enough to make it safe and accessible and, and fun and whatever you need to do to get that out there. So I went on this learning journey and um, yeah, I love what I do. I help people every day and I get to share this knowledge because it's simple, which I love, but it but it's really important. Sorry for the interruption. I just wanted to ask for a very quick favor, and that is to simply subscribe to the YouTube channel or if you're watching on Spotify or Apple Podcasts, then to follow. It's one of the best ways you can help to support this podcast and helps me to keep on making better and better episodes for you. Thank you so much for your support. Back to the episode. How long did it take you then to, to change that? Was it a quick change after learning what you learned? It was actually not so bad. So I trained myself. I didn't actually have anybody train me. I learned what I what I did from the podcast. I gave it a go. By that point, it wasn't as bad because I had um, grown up, but I'd also had um, sort of a wi widening of the teeth. So when I was about 12, which in my opinion is too late, um, children, I think, should be having preventative orthodontics as opposed to, oh, now you're bad enough, we'll sort of bodge this later. Um, so I had some expansion in the roof of my mouth when I was 12, which has slightly helped and allowed me to get my tongue positioned back. But the difference is I was still never told during the time of having braces that my tongue position was wrong, that I was swallowing wrong, that I was breathing wrong. And so although I could have switched it and made it easier, I didn't. So it was only when I heard the podcast that I started to change my tongue position and my nose started to feel a bit easier. Um, and then I changed my CO2 tolerance over time because I was using my nose more rather than my mouth. So I wasn't dumping as much air. So my body was getting used to having more carbon dioxide in my body. And I gradually pushed that up. And a lot of people can train their own breathing without needing to go to somebody like myself. Um, it's just that sometimes we've gone so far or there's so much anxiety around breath or we're so ingrained with we don't realize our perception is a little warped around what it should be that we can get stuck. Hence why, obviously, I'm there to kind of help um, as well. But so many of us can just change and say, OK, if we can get our tongue position right, we can make our nose then feel larger. We can accept our nose a little bit more and we keep going through just like with any personal growth. You, there's a little bit of discomfort or, you know, you have to get comfortable with that very slight discomfort. And then it, it pushes very quickly and you're no longer in that space anymore and you start to feel much more spacious. Yeah, I think that that surely would sound surprising to probably to the majority of people, because uh, I mean, I can, I can actually relate to this with arthritis. So if someone sees arthritis on an X-ray. Uh, this wear and tear process usually we you know we can't do a lot about unless you're going to replace the joint and yet there are loads of people walking around with arthritis that don't have pain and this is the way that we try to describe this in in practice is that just because you've got arthritis doesn't necessarily mean you have to be in pain we can't change the arthritis but what we can change is your function and that sounds like exactly what's going on there so you you've got there is a problem uh maybe a structural problem, whether uh, whatever that may be that's obstructing breathing. But what you've done is to be able to use what you've got and maximize its function. And actually you can function then just as well as anyone else. 
Yeah, so there's a really interesting area at the moment. So I'm um, speaking a lot with sort of orthodontists and dentists and myofunctional therapists and things like that. And I'm now part of a group who are really trying to push this education forward around um, looking at uh, our bodies in a functional way. So, um, you know, ENT surgeons, etc. So rather than just operating <laughs> or um, or just pulling teeth out. It's like, well, what can we be doing to allow the growth of this child to develop better? And where can we notice a bit earlier what we can do rather than just waiting or, or pulling things out rather than actually expanding? So I was lucky that I did have some expansion, but it was a bit of a as I say, a bit of a half-assed job. It wasn't quite the right um, expansion. It was a little bit too late, really. Um, had it been done a bit more, there would be quite a big difference. And had I continued, had, sorry, had I changed my breathing and changed my tongue, et cetera, earlier, I wouldn't have had maybe so much sort of regression. So my teeth are now sort of much more crooked again, much more narrow again. They sort of um, gone, the front teeth have gone slightly forward again. So I've lost the kind of the braces look that I had um, because I didn't know that that would be impacted, if that makes sense. But if we can start young with children, so for example, my child is five and I've just had her tongue tie released, but she didn't have an obvious tongue tie. It's not like I couldn't breastfeed her or anything like that. It was a slight tongue tie, but because I'm aware of this, I took her to get checked and there was some reduced function, which meant the very back of the tongue couldn't lift, which meant that she wasn't getting a full tongue seal and she was mouth breathing at night. And I know how much that can impact the concentration and the brain development and, and you know, sleep of a child. Um, and I really wanted to make sure that I was doing everything I could. So I took her to have a private tongue tie release, which wasn't the most pleasant experience. It'd be better if it was done as a baby. Um, but she was really brave. And, uh, and then we've been doing all of the tongue exercises every single night since to make sure that um, the stretching happens and it doesn't sort of reattach and, and scar. So she's much better now and much a much more able to do that. There's still a little bit of crowding because there's no gaps between her baby teeth, which is not a great sign in terms of we need space for the adult teeth to come through. So at some point in the next uh, two to three years, she will probably have some sort of uh, braces. They do sort of like Invisalign style braces and expansion braces if needed for children, even when they've just got a few um, sort of solid teeth rather than their milk teeth. So this is something I want. I'm passionate about because I think we have the option to do this, but this is not yet a standard. This is this is sort of the future of um, helping. Now, the reality here I think we should talk about is this is not how it should be. We shouldn't need to do braces for children. But one, we don't check for tongue ties like we used to. Um, and I, you know, I've heard off the internet of all places um, that ever since about the 1600s until about the Second World War, um, women who used to help deliver babies, whether midwives or community, they used to grow their little finger quite nail quite long and they used to nick underneath the child's tongue as it was born to ensure that it could breastfeed and then towards the end they started to bring in scalpels and obviously it was a lot more um based in in uh, hospitals as well but then somewhere along the line funding interest something didn't happen and i remember there was a big sort of formula uh push or what move quite a few years ago sort of saying that formula was better than breastfeeding and I'm never there to judge a parent whether they can breastfeed or not. You know, we do the best we can with what we've got and the knowledge we've got. Um, and it's not always possible, but there are important things around breastfeeding that it is strengthening. It does help to form our jaw properly. It does help to um, to develop us. And that tongue position and that tongue training is important through breastfeeding. So if we don't have a tongue tie cut and we can't breastfeed, but it's OK, this formula, We've missed out there on a on a, a crucial development issue. And we've also got things like we're maybe not getting the right nutrients in our diet. So we're maybe not forming correctly from that. We don't chew enough. I mean, I was certainly on your pureed foods as a child because that was the new thing. And it was, you know, healthy for a baby or whatever, or a child. And we now obviously have a bit more sort of, you know, crunching on carrots or whatever. But this isn't necessarily the norm. And beyond carrots... When do we ever chew? It's mostly ultra processed food nowadays. There's no real hard work. So we've missed out potentially on um, even if we do breastfeed, are we breastfeeding for as long as we used to? Probably not. Six months and my mum was back at work and I was having to do something else. You know, she did her best, but, you know, everybody's busy. Um, 
then we've got yeah the, the lack of chewing and then we've got the lack of good nutrients so we're we're struggling there and then if we don't know about tongue position if we're living with um, milk allergies mold in our house cat allergies dog allergies something like that you know if there's any reason why we start to feel congested and we don't know that that's a problem we don't deal with that there's so many reasons early on that we're not necessarily developing as optimally as we can now that does not mean we can't improve our breathing but it does mean we're set at a slight disadvantage it does mean that structurally because our tongue is no longer in the roof of our mouth because it's dropped to mouth breathe we then don't have it to form the top of our mouth around our top teeth to push it out and forward and wide. And then that impacts the size of the airway. Often our face is uh, more narrow. Sometimes the chin is further back. Sometimes we get a sort of larger nose. Um, the roof of the mouth, because um, the cheeks now are pushing in and the tongue is not pushing back out against it, that's sort of becoming narrower, more crooked. And then the roof of the mouth can be very, very high which then impacts this huge nasal cavity we have behind here. So it's impacting that as well. So then you can also end up with deviated septums too. And this is such an interesting thing. So many people say, oh yeah, but I've got a deviated septum. So, and I'm like, one, you don't know why. Two, you don't know like that that isn't necessarily important unless it's really severe. So it's kind of like we get told these things, but we don't actually know what to do with the information. And we're sort of structurally maybe impacted just like I am. But what do we do with that? So as a child, that can be really troublesome because it can cause the fact that they can't breathe well if they've then got inflamed adenoids and, and tonsils and issues like that. But still no one's saying we need to get this child nose breathing. We need to make sure they're um, aware of their tongue position. We need to empower them. It's all very sort of, you know, either ignore it or send them to a doctor and, you know, surgeries and drugs and et cetera. And I think this is a really big problem, but hopefully this is starting to change slowly. Yes. Good. Well, uh, so it sounds like, you know, on the medical front, we're doing okay, but on the functional front, probably not so great. And I also assume how many people like you are there around? Not enough. Yeah, sure. <laughs> um, there are breath coaches um, and, and technically I am a breath coach. However, I, I focus on an area that I have sort of learned through trial and error and, you know, personal experience and learning and, and, and being somebody who looks at patterns and asks questions that maybe others aren't asking. So I do feel that many people are coming through into the breath coaching field, but that can be breath work i.e. like Wim, Wim Hof sort of you know, hyperventilation breathing. It can be calming stuff like box breathing, like in for four, hold for four, out for four, hold for four. It can be um, very, very slow stuff. It could be sort of transcendent stuff. It can be all, there's, there's so many different types of breath work. And these are all incredible. Like they're really, really powerful for what they are. Um, would I put somebody into a hyperventilation breath work if they are somebody who doesn't breathe well? No, uh, because they're already an overbreather, and then you're over breathing loads more. So you'll feel like maybe amazing in the moment. And then between sessions, you start to feel even worse because you've actually sort of trained even further in the wrong direction. So I always say, like, if you want to use these sort of in intense hacks, learn how to breathe properly and then go and play with them. Um, the, the slowing breath and the calming breath work is great, but it's not enough. We're not talking about function we're not talking about posture we're not talking about you know how much air how it should feel how you can recognize that so there's a definitely a gap there and this is the air i came through and i was like we're missing some things here like this is amazing but we're missing something and so that's why i look really at the subtleties of posture awareness perception and we have to really think about what are the different areas that are holding us back from doing the right thing you know if i say to you take a deep breath what would you do yeah i guess i know that the the natural thing is just to uh, to use the, the chest and and the abdomen isn't it like, but why is it natural because we've seen it exactly so a lot of people if i say take a deep breath um will lift big looking breath that's their perception into the upper chest, maybe into here as well, but usually tilting as opposed to expanding. So this upper chest breath and maybe even like out through the mouth on the way out. We have seen this everywhere. This is in cartoons, 
films. This is footballers with commentators saying they're taking a big deep breath. You know, we've got, it's everywhere. You know, our teachers, our yoga teachers, our meditation teachers, everybody is um, passing on this sort of knowledge that isn't really knowledge at all. They've they've watched something and done something different. And I sort of explain to people, it's a little bit like me sort of saying sort of, hold, okay, so hold your um, hand up next to your face here. Okay. And then take your hand and put it on your chin and you just put it on your cheek. You watch <laughs> me. Yeah. So, <laughs> set me up. <laughs> there we go. I totally set you up. But this is exactly it. You know, yeah. even when you think you're concentrating, if somebody is in a yoga class and you have a trust for that teacher, for example, and they say, take a deep breath. Your perception now is that is a big looking breath. You're not sitting there thinking, hang on, but that's shallow. Why are you going into the top of your lungs where, you know, imagine like an upside down tree where the canopy is at the bottom here and your, your diaphragm is underneath. So where, sort of where the split of your ribs is, you can feel the, the part of the diaphragm. And as that plunges down, we're pulling into that canopy there. That's all the leaves. That's where all the action happens with the gases. But we've just got a few little leaves up here on a couple of branches. And all of this is dead space. All the branches and trunk are dead space. So if we're doing this sort of... We're shallow. Now, we think maybe we're also going down here, but if we're tilting and lifting, we are certainly not filling all the way down here. So it's not even a big, deep breath. It's just a big looking breath. And this is one of my absolute pet hates because so many of us will see, you know, a T-shirt saying, just breathe. Or, you know, um, somebody says, breathe into your feet or belly breathe, which I absolutely hate as well. Um, the reason for the feet is quite funny because it's like just trying to imagine that it's, it's amusing and it can be helpful. But um, breathing to your belly, for example, or belly breathing is really unhelpful because we tend to find people bloating uh, from the belly button as opposed to using the diaphragm. So they have a restrictive breathing into the belly or restrictive breathing into the upper chest. But they then overbreathe rather than reducing their breath for a normal day. And then they underbreathe rather than breathing well and wide for sport. So we have complete perception warps in terms of what breath should be. Um, and this is a real problem. This is what we need to start changing. My perception was that you shouldn't breathe up here using your accessory muscles until you need to get more oxygen. But I have a feeling you're going to tell me that's wrong. Mm. So, <laughs> <laughs> and I don't mind you telling me that's wrong, by the way. I mean, I want to say this for me to say that's absolutely wrong is um, a little arrogant because there will be times where breathing into your upper chest may be relevant. There will be to particular sports. It may be relevant. However, let's go for a general rule of thumb here. If we are breathing into our upper chest, bearing in mind there's only a few leaves here and you've got restrictive access to your, to your lungs, but there's a lot of work. And most people will know they're using up here, not because they know they're using up here, but because they have chronic tension in their neck, upper shoulders, back, and maybe across the front here. And I bet loads of people listening to this are like, oh yeah, I have loads of tension up there. I never really thought I was a chest breather though. And yet then they put their hand on, they can feel maybe a little bit or they can't feel it, but they look and then they can see a little bit. It doesn't have to be very much. Even a little bit is movement we shouldn't be doing. So we get trapped in this sort of upper chest area. And some people think, yeah, we need to go like this to get sport. But I really want to show you uh, the difference. So I should have brought my balloon with me. So I normally have a little balloon and it shows the difference. So if I sort of breathe into the upper chest here and I try and blow up a little balloon, nothing would happen. There's no diaphragm pushing. There's no sort of real pressure to get into this balloon. I can't do it from this upper chest area. So that's when I become one of those people that goes, I can't blow up balloons. I'll just pass it to my partner at the birthday party. It's not that they have a, like small lungs. So they just don't know how to use them properly. So this is unhelpful. If we go into the belly area and we try and sort of like, and you can get sort of like a balloon, maybe the size of, you know, my two hands together like this, just from the belly. So you can blow it up, but it's restricted. And then if you pull fully into all around the bottom of the ribs, so not just the front tilt, but all around the back muscles engaging the sides expanding like this mm. 
than I can get. Right. So it's it's the full expansion rather than just the, the tummy coming out. Exactly. It's the incredible expansion all the way around to which if you are in the wrong posture, you won't necessarily access this as well. So those who, for example, so I've just started recently working with professional footballers and a lot of them just sit like they're teenagers, you know, like they're just sort of slouched and a bit hang, you know, hang down their shoulders. They don't sort of stand with, with a, with a posture, you know, that they don't stand sort of elegantly and tall and strong and confident. Um, not all of them, some of them do, but you know, this sort of, this, this, this slumping, which is so common in with so many people, um, even if we're sporty, even if we're at the top of our sport, we, we don't necessarily have, then have the access to, really open up because our day-to-day breathing is so restricted and over breathing so then as soon as we don't go into a sport situation you think well they're athletes they should be great but oh my gosh they're not they they don't have this education because they've never been taught as a human they and they, they've never been taught because they're an athlete as a human either and so they're missing out on this general training before they even get, you know, on a pitch or on a, on a track and field or whatever it is. Um, and I did exactly the same. I went out to Paris um, this year for the Olympics and I went out to Ollie House where it was like a hospitality house for the, for the Olympians from all around the world from any year. And they came in, I gave talks and workshops and I did one-to-one training and hands-on stuff. And it was incredible. People from all over the world, from all different sports and the lack of education that they'd been given around breath was insane. They just, they, some of them, great, had some good expansion, but could go a little bit more. Didn't know about that. Others, they were lifting in the front. They were lifting into the upper chest. You know, these are potentially long distance runners and stuff that still hadn't optimized their breathing. Um, And it's, it's not that we can't perform, but imagine if we were that good and we got our breathing uh, to our optimal state. We're using less energy. We're not having to go into the upper chest because we're using less energy just to use the maximum gain area. If you then also need that for any reason, because you're at the very peak of your of your performance at that moment, fine. But that's only in that moment, not generally. And the big issue we have as well is that people who live in the upper chest, who are always here, they don't even realize the signal, the early warning, like a tsunami signal. You know, we don't get that early warning signal because it is our upper chest moving. That's the signal. So if we are constantly there, we don't realize how quickly we're heading towards anxiety or panic attack because that first anxious breath to me feels really strange and really tight. And I actively combat that with breath work or attention, conscious breathing. But for somebody who's not getting that signal, they're way down the road before they get any form of idea that they're, they're going that way. Mm. Gosh, that's crazy. That's, so, so essentially you should be able to do sport and not need to breathe up here and use these muscles. You should be able to get enough capacity down here. It depends on the sport. So I'm, I want to be very generic okay, about sure. this. It depends on the sport. I'm sure there are situations where somebody might pull everything. Um, but for the general day-to-day public who are going for a run, you know, couch to 5K, maybe even doing marathons, whatever, if you're doing a long-term sport thing like that, you don't want to be using huge amounts of energy. You want to be doing absolutely the most efficient use of your energy as possible. If you're using all the backup muscles as well as your main diaphragm muscle and ribs, then you're just going to, you know, you're not going to get very much more for the amount of effort you're putting in. And I think this is the bigger problem. These backup muscles are here so that we can breathe, not so that it, it's, it's to survive, not to thrive. So if I'm sort of slouched in my chair, like in a C shape, like, you know, like most traditional laptop users these days, mm. <laughs> um, or, or, you know, a gaming on my, on my, uh, you know, whatever they're called now, you know, it's not Game Boys anymore, is it? <laughs> Switch, I think. I don't know. I've lost track too. <laughs> Haven't yeah. got one for my child, whatever <laughs> it is. Um, you know, when we're stuck in this sort of slumped position, we can't actually use our diaphragm properly. Um, and this is actually something that, when I came into this field, I coined a new spot on the body <laughs> um, called the D spot for the diaphragm spot, because although everybody knows of the G spot generally um, and, you know, fun and interesting and people remember it, the idea is that, you know, that's all very well. 
we've also got the end spot for our tongue, which also existed. And I was like, I love this idea of spots because people know where what they're aiming for, at least, rather than sort of being unsure because belly could be three different areas you're breathing into. So we want to isolate to the right area. We want to know how to feel. So I um, sort of coined this concept called a D-spot, which is just about three fingers down from the split of your ribs. So below your sternum. We usually wear like a bra strap would sit on the front for a woman. The very, very front, you go three fingers down from there onto a bouncy bit, but it's quite high up from your belly button. And this D spot, this won't work if I'm sitting in a slouch. I cannot use it properly. But if I'm sitting or standing in the right position, I can breathe without moving any upper chest, without moving any belly button area or below. And I am isolated to the spot. And as I breathe, it moves out as I breathe in. It stops. That's enough air. I breathe out, it goes back. So many people, if they ever access this, will go then into the upper chest as well to complete their breath. This is over breathing. Is there a, can you show what it looks like if you breathe from this area, but you're, so you're not using this, so you've, you've got that part, so you, you've uh, turned that off. But you're bloating. Bloating. So if you're so you've turned off the upper chest, there's no movement there, but you're bloating the belly. I find it very hard to do because I'm not a belly bloater. So Yeah, okay. Could you can actually do that motion without move without breathing as well, can't you? Yes. So I suppose that's the type of motion that you're trying to avoid. You can. So so if you feel like you're bloating your guts out, this is basically more a case of your perception of breath yeah. than a natural deep breath. We can go too deep in the sense of you're not going too deep within your lungs, obviously. You, you want to go as deep as you can with lungs, but people are perceiving their belly button and below to bloat, meaning that's where the air is going. It's going as deep as possible. But no, your diaphragm is underneath your lungs. It plunges down. On that D spot, you will feel the diaphragm. And because we can't really feel our diaphragm because it's inside us, it's really hard to get that feedback. Mm. We can also touch just the front sides of the ribs instead. And, and they can slightly um, splay. But yeah. for having that spot there, it gives real feedback. And the nice thing about it is you can tell if you're, for example, like a backwards breather. So somebody who breathes um, backwards would be somebody who maybe has had a lot of trauma in their life or um, maybe they have very restrictive clothing. Um, maybe they're, you know, they regularly have panic attacks or something that, you know, um, makes them feel unsafe on a regular basis. Some people have um, had sort of unsafe home lives or work lives or whatever. So this is something that I come across obviously a lot within the work I do, but not everybody is like this. Mm -hmm. But some people have the upper chest going up and then the, what, the D spot goes in as they breathe in. So this is the wrong way. Yeah. And that then sends you backwards. That sort of, it just lifts, everything yeah. lifts. So rather than that, we want the D spot to be moving outwards as you breathe in, pushing into your fingers, swelling a little bit, but it's just that spot. And we're turning off that sort of bloating or over relaxation of the whole belly. It's not that we want to be tense, but we, we need to think about a little bit more like elegance and strength and posture which so many of us have lost nowadays because we're just all so weak and we just sit and slouch and no one even tries to but we don't know that it impacts us we don't know that our breath relies on the fact that we actually sit in a way so this gives a really good training tool rather than going to like finishing school for your posture <laughs> um we're we're instead just learning to breathe and by learning to breathe you actually improve your posture, which then improves various other things, which then means you don't actually necessarily have to go to the chiropractor every three months with your bad back that, you know, because you sit so badly at your laptop. Instead, you've changed your habits and it starts to change. And I have had that where um, a lawyer, she worked, with me, she, she worked with me and literally after about six weeks, she was like, you know, I just don't sit at my desk in the same way. I don't have to go and, you know, get myself fixed <laughs> every three months. You know, it was this feeling of, I finally changed something for myself. And that was really wonderful. Yeah, because you're what you're doing there is getting to the cause of that person's problem. And that's what I'm noticing uh, now, particularly with those people that they uh, they get better, but then it does keep coming back. Or maybe we're actually struggling to see the improvement. It's like, okay, let's have a look at your breath. Ah, right. I mean, 
yeah, that this just doesn't, you know, you, 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 as you're saying, you look using these muscles, then you're going to be using them, you're going to get more tension in that area and that's going to lead to neck pain. We see that a lot. It almost sounds like then to me that um, this is like your backup generator and this is like the the main power source and the more efficient this is and provided this is is working, then you shouldn't actually need this unless, you know, you're really, really needing a lot of oxygen. Um but it does make sense because I was thinking, because I just, heard, you know, before you came on, I heard you say a few things about this and I was saying, OK, but then why would we why would we have the ability to breathe up here? But it makes sense because, as you say, you know, sometimes you have to get into bad positions. OK, nowadays it's when we're in this bad posture and breathing is quite important. So to have quite a lot of backup systems makes a lot of sense. Yeah. I mean, you know, if we are injured um, if we're restricted, if we, you know, whatever happens, you know, the lungs are very, um, they're incredible, but they can go wrong and we can be stuck in positions. You know, we could be crammed into, you know, the sort of back of a car, you know, traveling in a different country, whatever, you know, just unable to even really get any space. And yet you still need to be able to breathe for that two hours or whatever you're traveling in that moment. You know, we could be in a position where we're having to carry things that, is uncomfortable or we're having to, um, you know, have children on us or whatever that they're pressing on the area that we want to breathe into, you know, there's always going to be a reason why there will be restrictions to our breath. So that's why we need to be able to use other muscles. And we always will use them if needed in the same way that, you know, that sort of change <laughs> in anxiety breath, you know, but it is a signal, you know, our body's incredible. It gives us signals if only we understand it. But we're so we're so unaware of our bodies these days that, you know, and, and I have been the same. You know, I'm not somebody who's grown up like this and constantly had awareness of my body. I've had to learn it. Um, but we we have these signals we can utilize, but then we need to be empowered to do something about it. So if I started going, <laughs> you know, my instant reaction without any knowledge, if I'm starting to feel like, oh my God, <laughs> is to go, I need more air. <laughs> And that is the biggest problem we have is our only education around breathing is something we've picked up from somewhere without any real knowledge behind it. And I need more air is not my biggest problem right now. I need to be delivering my oxygen to my brain and to my cells. And me hyperventilating is not going to help that happen because I'm dumping the carbon dioxide. So I'm expelling really, really fast. Um, and I'm really aware that this carbon dioxide it's needed to actually deliver my oxygen but because i know that i'm like okay let's pause it let's slow it down let's take control let's feel empowered and i can basically um change that so if you imagine sort of red red london double decker buses for example and we take like three buses and they're driving down um our blood vessel for example as a road so we want like a motorway we want sort of three abreast and when those three buses arrive at our brain or our muscles, there's little porters on duty and they open the doors and they let the oxygen off. So you've got like two per bus, so that's six in total. And the porters are carbon dioxide, but also they're also like road wideners as well. So they have jobs to do. So you need enough of them on duty to do all these jobs they need to do. If you overbreathe, if you hyperventilate or you just slightly overbreathe all the time so you're a bigger hole, i.e. the mouth, faster, harder, shallower, you know, this sort of <laughs> increase, you're not keeping in the, the carbon dioxide quite long enough, like it is a waste gas, but it just has a job to do before it leaves. If we don't have that moment for it to do its job in the right quantities, then we start to narrow our roads to a dual carriageway or two lane road. If we hyperventilate even more, single carriageway. If it gets really bad, you know, the one where you're like, you know, can't breathe at all. This sort of re reminds me of like, so we live near Oxford. So in Oxford, there's this particular lane where you uh, can drive down it, double yellow lines down both sides, and then it just narrows and narrows and narrows and narrows and narrows to like a bollard at the end. <laughs> and, the, and the lines are sort of, you know, like less than a meter apart. So it's this, this insane sort of concept of, well, this is not quite a road, but it reminds me a bit like that. You know, how are we meant to deliver the oxygen if you're not opening that road wide enough? But also if the porters aren't there enough, you end up rather than six porters opening six doors, you end up with, with three porters on three doors. And so the porters are letting carbon dioxide out? No, they are the carbon dioxide. So they're letting oxygen out 
of the bus and allowing the oxygen to enter the cell. And then the carbon dioxide finishes, finishes its shift. It goes onto the bus and it drives back around to the lungs to be expelled. It picks more oxygen up from the lungs. It comes back around to your cells. It delivers, etc. So it's very simple, very kind of like, you know, visual concept. But if you're thinking about your buses and you're thinking about your oxygen delivery, you're thinking... It's not about all breathing more. It's about holding on to the CO2 just long enough. It's about slowing the breath. Um, that doesn't mean we don't need to get enough oxygen in, but generally we have more than we need plenty at this, at this you know, sea level. <laughs> um, we are absolutely fine. Up, right up a mountain, it can change, um, but we are actually getting enough oxygen and we are actually giving out far more than we're using. So it's getting a, a healthy balance then of the carbon dioxide and the, the oxygen. But we're not in balance because we're all over breathing. Like there's yeah. sort of this too big, you know, all three parts of the chest, belly and, and um, D-spot are all expanding or two out of three are expanding when we breathe just normally at rest. We can see that someone is breathing. We shouldn't really see that someone's breathing. Like there should be a very slight ripple underneath the clothing just here. And is over breathing then, is that what happens pretty much to everyone that isn't breathing correctly? to compensate basically when somebody is not breathing well they are generally over breathing yeah. what that over breathing looks like can be different it can be backwards breathing it can be two parts over breathing three parts over breathing it could be mouth breathing but you're actually into the fine area like it can be lots of different things so because it can um because it can show up differently obviously we need to know what we're aiming for but we also need to understand what we're doing um, and to be able to recognize that's really important. So that's why I spend uh, quite a lot of my time doing sort of assessments for people actually showing. We do that over Zoom as well. Um, so they book in, we actually have assessments and they like, you know, within this hour, we literally work at everything. Their hands are on. I ask them questions I can see. We go through the whole thing and they're like, I did not know that about myself. And then I can actually perceive certain things about them, about, you know, whether they holding certain things or you know whether they're like maybe don't put themselves first and you can pick up on certain things about someone and then you can get to the point where they're like okay i'm ready to i'm ready to do something about this now now i know where i'm at now i know why but i know i can do something about it and that's very empowering yeah okay that yeah that makes sense I, i'd like to just go into a couple may, maybe a couple of the maybe more common types of issues that you come across what what would you say is the most common problem that someone comes to you for that someone comes to me for versus what they have. Um, like symptom, let's say. <laughs> so really common things are obviously things like stress, but they wouldn't necessarily come to me for stress because they don't know until they know. So once they've looked at my stuff on LinkedIn or something, they might. Typically, it's something like snoring mm -hmm. or high anxiety and panic attacks. Um, the other one it can be is breathlessness. So if someone's breathless, it could be more of an asthma issue. Or it could be more of a, um, maybe they've got damaged their lungs, but even somebody with damaged their lungs, just because they've got damaged their lungs doesn't mean they can't be breathing better than they are. So whenever I have somebody who's more of what I call a kind of clinical situation where they have got a clinical issue that I can't help them with, it's more a case of going, look, we're not expecting you to be breathing optimally. But for what you've got, we should be breathing optimally. And I think that's the situation where people need to go, well, actually, no one's ever told me that. They've given me drugs at the hospital. They've given me this. They've given me that. But no one's ever actually said that I'm breathing in the wrong direction. Now, if there is, for example, scarring or, or um, you know, hardening around the bottom of the lungs, that might be really difficult. But it doesn't necessarily mean there's no possibility of improvement. So this is an area to look at. Around um, asthma, this could be a case of, People can have asthma. It doesn't mean that by breathing better, it cures it, but it's more a case of it may not bother you like it did before. So a lot of people with asthma are just mouth breathers. So they're taking in dry, cold, irritating air filled with viruses, filled with bacteria, filled with, um, you know, um, uh, pollen and and whatever else irritates them, sort of allergens and bits, you know, bits of plastic or exhaust fumes or whatever. So if we are breathing with our mouth, it is literally a highway straight into our lungs. So then our lungs are going to get irritated. They're not going to feel as good. They're not going to work as well. They're going to maybe make us cough or, you know, we're not going to, we're going to feel more breathless because we've actually just irritated them. If we use our nose, we have a filter. It's a natural filter on our face that we were given. Uh, and if we use that, we're able to filter out the viruses, uh, you know, particles, bacteria, allergens, etc. But we're also warming and moistening the air. 
So it's preparing it for the lungs and that allows it to be more optimal because we want it to be warm and moist in there. But in the same way, a lot of people have learned things like cyclical breathing for running. So they'll breathe in through their nose, out through their mouth. Mm, I don't necessarily think this is the best way. Uh, not to say that can't work for some people, but if you're breathing out through your mouth, you're not re-moistening and re-warming your no nose in order to re-warm and re-moisten the air on the way back in. So especially on a cold day, that's going to bother you a lot more. And I think people would struggle with their running and maybe end up switching to their mouth and then end up wanting to put scarves over their mouth to try and make it warmer. So we get this kind of like people find their little hacks to get through life. But this is down to a basic concept that we've just never really thought about. That's interesting because I, I um, maybe this is the problem then, because sometimes when I go for a run, I come back and it, you can feel it on your chest and it feels like I've taken on a lot of dry, cold air. So are you saying that you can run? Because what I... This is going to sound really weird, but um, I've had a lot of teeth issues for a while. And um, one of the things that I'm finding that's helping, particularly with staining, is doing some oil pulling. So, and one of the things I like to do in the morning is always go for a walk. So I thought, why not combine the both? So I, I get oil in my mouth and I go for a walk. And um, I'm dreading the day someone comes up to me to speak to me because that would be very awkward. Um, <laughs> but then I was like, ah, oh, maybe I combine this with just going for a bit of a run. So, of course, having oil in your mouth, you can't breathe out your mouth. So I tried to start going for a run just using my nose, but I found I couldn't get enough oxygen. Do you think I should be able to do that? So I would challenge you on, I found I couldn't get enough oxygen. Uh-huh. I thought you might say that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so if you were going for a run and it feels hard as though you're not getting enough oxygen, I'd say two things. One, your CO2 tolerance may not be high enough. Therefore, it's triggering you earlier because you're now making more carbon dioxide because you're running. You're using so the oxygen that you've breathed in. I'm not saying this for your purposes, but for everybody else. So your oxygen you breathed in, your carbon from your food, making the carbon dioxide in your cells as a waste gas to go out. If you're then using more oxygen because you're running, so therefore creating more carbon dioxide, you're building your CO2 level much higher, much faster, which is not what you're used to when you're just walking gently. When that happens, if your tolerance is too low, um, and that's a little bit like one end is <laughs> bam into a, into a panic attack wall and the other end is slow it down. But if it's too low, it's slow it down and <gasps> trigger because I'm not breathing enough, right? But that, that wall is too, too close to the panic attack end. We want it to come back out to where it should be over here. But if you're running, you might want it even further. So whereas for some people I aim for like a like a breath hold um, test that we do. And let's say the measurement on somebody who's really struggling with panic attacks might be like 10, 15, 20. Um, somebody who's maybe desk worker might be 30. Somebody who's running might be 40, 45. So you might be somewhere like 27 right now. You're probably not too bad. You know, you don't mouth, mouth breathe most of the time. You're quite comfortable using the nose until you start running. And then it's not quite enough. So that's one side I'd say it's probably that you need to train your CO2 tolerance um, in order to feel like you can tolerate the buildup rather than it going, <laughs> needing more air. And the other side is that you may not be drawing enough into your ribs. So you may be breathing too fast. Um, and not feeling that you're actually filling and expanding well. Um, and so there can be a restriction there, either perception restriction or physical restriction or a bit of both. But usually it's a case of just learning to train that to then open it back up again and have access. And the best way of training your CO2 tolerance, I want to say, is it just practicing holding your breath? So CO2 tolerance training um, can have uh, a varied thing. And again, it's different depending on where you are on the level. So I don't want to like give too much generic advice, but effectively when you slow down from mouth breathing to nose breathing, because there's less air being um, pushed out, that is a start on the journey. So just by training your tongue position, and actually we talked about tongue position earlier, um, on my on my website, so on linkbreathing.co.uk, on the homepage, there is the possibility of getting a free video on there called the end spot tongue training video and so they can actually just go there watch it and within like four minutes or so they know exactly what to do to train their tongue um and this will be the first step of breathing retraining so it's from my online course but i brought it out so it can be free so everybody can access that because i think it's important we all have you all have the starting the idea so when your tongue is trained your airway is more open now you can then accept that a bit better than you did before and you can push through the oh i would normally open my mouth now but i'm just gonna 
calmly sit with this or stop moving or reduce my movement so that I can tolerate it because we can't do it at speed maybe to start with. And then we build up over time. Somebody who does breath holds, but more like in, out, hold in a kind of relaxed, calm breath hold sense. This can be really helpful for improving your CO2 tolerance. But those who are pregnant, especially first trimester, we don't advise doing extended breath holds. So we don't want somebody trying to train for this in that situation. Some people might not feel comfortable with this if they don't want to put stress on their body. So if they've got any major heart conditions or any sort of thing where their doctors basically like just don't put stress on your body, I wouldn't want them to go and do it. So this is why I'm, there's a balance here between education and how far you'd push someone because that's more extreme training if you're starting to do breath holds. What I would say is a better way for those who just want to keep it safe is just to slow your breath down through everything, even when you're walking, slow it down so much more than you normally would when you're walking. Let it go for a lot more paces than you would normally. And every time you do this throughout the day, it will improve over time. The extreme stuff is for the extreme and it's not something I'm comfortable sort of going into here because yeah. I don't want people going like, yeah, and then having a problem if they're not ready. I wanted to touch on apnea because you mentioned snoring. Um, and so that makes sense. Improve your breathing. You can see improvements in snoring. What about apnea? So um, snoring and sleep apnea are sort of part of the same camp, but different. Um, Snoring is effectively noisy breathing during sleep. So if it's just snoring, we're looking at something like um, vibration, for example, restriction. For some people, just changing their tongue position can be enough to stop snoring which is very cool because I do have people come to my talks and stuff and then message me about two weeks later and be like, you'll never guess. Like ever since I came to your talk and trained my tongue position, I stopped snoring, which is wonderful, but it's obviously not suitable for everyone. It's like the first part for most people. Um, So this is the difference. So if my tongue is in the wrong position, it will sound like this. If my tongue is in the right position, same face shape, same air, same everything, except for my tongue position. Yeah, that's the difference. So I'm no longer like <laughs> with my tongue in the so, back of my throat. So, oh, so the tongue is is down on the, on that. And the on first, that first one, one is dropped. Yes. It falls then back into the throat because it's dropped to the bottom of my mouth like a mouth breather. Because <laughs> I'm completely blocked. Whereas if I pull it up and I seal it to the roof of the mouth, which is which is shown in that video, it then pulls up into what we call like the N spot, N and when your tip of your tongue is in the end spot, so not touching your teeth, but slightly further back than your teeth, the tip is there and then you pull the rest up. So it's a bit like skiing. You would never ski off with just your toe on a ski. You'd always click your heel down as well and then ski off. Same with the tongue. So N, but then lift the rest into like a seal. So if I hold my nose, I can't breathe through my mouth. It's completely sealed off in the roof of my mouth. Now, if we're somebody who has really, really um, narrow mouth, like they just have not got any space because unfortunately they were never looked after from the orthodontics point of view and it was just so severe then they may never be able to get their tongue position up there okay. which is a challenge um and that's someone where i would struggle to deal with that without them potentially having some sort of quite severe orthodontics which is not ideal they can still improve their breathing but it's not going to ever have that beautiful training of the tongue being trained therefore the nose always works so, so it's not as seamless um so if we can get the tongue up though and then lift that then opens up and it pulls it out and we have then the much bigger airway down the back and it's no longer in the throat the second part is we can look at like the vibration of the palate and the the neck and the tongue. So if somebody's got like what I like to call like saggy sides. <laughs> so all of this is sort of untoned. For example, someone who doesn't sing um, would be much more like this. Whereas if you sing, you're much more likely to have good tone. Um, and so this can then sort of um, vibrate a bit more. And that can be a reason for it. Because if you think about an overbreather, they're taking air too fast and hard. And then you're fast and hard past flappy sides. And that's why we're getting the vibration. You reduce the airflow down because you retrain your breathing. Even with slightly saggy sides, you might get away with it. But you then add something like alcohol and relaxation. And then that's why a lot of people say their snoring gets worse with alcohol. This is the sort of snoring side. um, And the tongue position is really crucial and the air and that. When it comes to sleep apnea, this is often down to restriction. So it can be, again, the tongue and sort of feeling but it's often down to the development of them as well so 
in terms of um, if they've got such a narrow space and a narrow small airway, it could be they just can't get their tongue out of their throat. And this is a major problem. This is where the orthodontics side of things needs to change <laughs> um, because we should never have allowed humans to get to this stage. We should never have overlooked the fact that they cannot just they can't breathe in their sleep. And, you know, we now have huge sleep studies and, you know, you can even you know get rings and watches and stuff that tell you about sleep apnea episodes. I'm like, this is great. But it's all very well finding out at 40, you've got a sleep apnea episode. But what about the fact that we should have been told when we were a child and that their own children still aren't being told and therefore we're just repeating the whole thing again? So this is my biggest problem with this. I can help people with sleep apnea, but not all people with sleep apnea. And I'm very careful. I don't advertise for sleep apnea because it's a very medicalized area and it is usually due to restriction of which I am I can't see inside. And I don't want people feeling like they're not going to get the improvement. I have had somebody with sleep apnea who didn't like wearing the, the CPAP machine and who really was not sleeping well at night. And this is actually on my podcast on living more of a life. I've got a, 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 an audio actually talking to him about it. Um, and he he was a very severe case. Do you want me to share the, the particular case? Yeah, go for it, yeah. So he was um, a dad. He'd had, um, about age 16, he had an accident where um, he was cut with a rope through his neck and it completely went through his his windpipe um, and his larynx. And he basically had to have life searching surgery and obviously luckily survived. But despite going through all the medical side, having to relearn how to talk, having to, I mean, there was a lot he had to go through. 25 years later, one of his friends sort of says, hey, maybe you should speak to this breathing lady. <laughs> um, having worked with me just for something much more, uh, um, it's for less severe. And, you know, he was at the point where he was sleeping on a yoga mat downstairs away from his kids and wife so they could get to sleep. He had to go to sleep two hours after them because his snoring was so bad. It was like a jet engine. Um, he was so tired. He would only be sleeping sort of like 40 minutes to two and a half hours at night. And he was having to nap in his van just to get through the day. He was always tired, like didn't have like much energy for the kids. Couldn't do exercise. He tried to run, he just collapse. And this is a guy who used to be really sporty. He used to have, you know, this life that was different. Um, and he was, you know, it was affecting relationship and life in general. So I said to him, I was like, well, I've never really done thing or dealt with anything like this before. This is, you know, it's quite early on in my career doing what I do. And I was like, I don't really want to make you any promises because I just don't know about structurally what's going on here, but I can see you're not breathing well. So I could see he was breathing to his upper chest. He was breathing fast, hard. He was panicking about his breath. He was waking with sleep apnea and then, and then sort of breathless and panicking as well. And I just said, look, let's just deal with the basics and see what happens. And in six weeks, he was back in his bed with his wife. He was getting like seven to nine hours sleep a night. He was no longer embarrassed to go camping. He was able to like not have to nap in the van to get through the day. He had energy after work for his kids. He was, um, he took up jogging, obviously not extreme stuff, but jogging, paddle boarding. He could actually get back on the paddle board without getting out of breath. And, you know, he, he will always have a restriction. He will always have a sort of huskiness to the voice and things, but he just did. He, you know, he put in the work. He listened to everything I told him about. He really went through the motions and, and he reaped the rewards. And he was the reason I gave up my sort of a day job that I was doing alongside to start with. He was the reason I went, okay, you know, this is more than just a little bit better sleep or a bit of stress. Like this is quite, quite a lot and this needs a lot of work. So, um, yeah, he was my, he was my kind of eye opening client that was, you know, I've had others, but this one was really special. Oh, I imagine. And because the power of changing your breathing was just so well demonstrated in that case. And that must've just ignited you i mean I, you know you say you're passionate about it but you don't just say it. i can like see it in your voice <laughs> I can and feel it yeah exactly <laughs> like you really come alive when you're speaking about it and um yeah i mean i i would say like day to day that the more uh dramatic cases i have in a day the just the more exciting it makes it and you know they also say that the types of jobs where you're helping people tend to be the most satisfying and when you when you get that kind of thing it's it must be a very satisfying work to do yeah absolutely and you know so many people struggle without anyone knowing you know and i've actually really enjoyed the other side of sort of starting to work with people who maybe you know 
like CEOs of companies or people who are quite well known mm. or, you know, people who are in, in the public eye and like, like footballers, for example, got no real interest necessarily in, you know, I'm not really interested in celebrities or footballers or whatever. Like it doesn't interest me. I'm not like, oh, wow, fangirl. I'm just like, I really enjoy that a lot of these sorts of people who never really tell anyone they're struggling or don't ever feel they can open up about how they really feel. So especially with like tops of companies, they'll often work with me because they need it, but they also don't have anyone to talk to about how they feel and what the triggers were and that sort of thing. So although they could go to a, um, a psychologist or a, or a counselor or someone and they, and sometimes they do, sometimes it's the case that they don't necessarily want to go through that. They just, they just want to be able to actually tell someone how they feel <laughs> on that day and that they are anxious and, you know, something like that. And when it's relinked to the breath and it's so compassionate, it's really amazing. And if you've got somebody who's struggled with their sport and they're hiding it because they don't want someone to know about something, again, you can feel very lonely and it can be very isolating. And the same with snoring. You can feel very embarrassed or, or sad about something. And I think it, it's not, this isn't just breath. This is, this is so much more, you know, this is so much more about dealing with a human for how they need to be sort of held in that space and, and, and hand, handheld through a process and it's where they feel still themselves, but they also have that support where they need it. Um, and that's, that's really been quite special for me because I think a lot of people just teach breath, but to, to really know how to hold that space and to be there and to have that ability to, to keep it secret if necessary and, and, you know, a, a, and help them with a space that they wouldn't feel comfortable maybe going to a doctor about. Um, that's really important. Mm. Yeah. So it, I know you said that you don't advertise for apnea, but it certainly sounds like that if you're struggling with really any kind of breathing issue, whether you've been diagnosed with something or not, it's only going to be a benefit to you if you can improve the, improve the function of your breathing. Your daily breathing. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Like uh, I will say to anybody, I mean, what is the worst that can happen? Like you are, you are, you are probably not breathing great because just society in general, we don't move enough. We don't chew enough. We don't sit well enough. You know, we are constantly doing stuff that's convenient. Um, you know, just like, oh, I can't even bother to go to the shops. I'll just get a takeaway delivered to my door. You know, I'll crawl out of bed and I'll go back to Netflix for the next three hours in a slump position with no, you know, recovery position for my diaphragm. Like this is just normalized now. Um, and it, even if you're not that severe and you, you know, you think you're more active, this is still an area we're just not doing anywhere near what we should be doing in order to have optimal breathing habits. And you add in sort of the fact we've got fragrances and chemicals and stuff in our homes in general, and we're constantly irritated by things and we're all, you know, lots of us are allergic to stuff and, you know, it, life has changed. You know, we didn't used to need to be told. That is a big thing. Um, I wrote a poem about this the other day, actually, and it was sort of talking about it. It was like, you know, we didn't need to be told. We, You know, back then it was different. You know, we used our bodies. We labored. We um, we didn't sit in comfy chairs. We sat on hard stools or, or, you know, hard chairs or on the floor where we are in natural positions. And so much of what we do nowadays has deteriorated. So why wouldn't your breathing have it? And, and that's a great thing. I think nowadays with a lot more social media how that's becoming more mainstream media almost it's a lot easier to get it's easier to spread this type of information um what about anxiety um so obviously i appreciate that anxiety has many different aspects to it what's what kind of impact have you seen with improving someone's breathing that suffers anxiety so again, there are so many different versions of this, depending on the person and the triggers and the reasons. For some people, it's like they're holding trauma in their breath from you know childhood trauma or whatever it is, or abusive relationships or whatever. Um, there are so many reasons why we can hold this. Um, but obviously, they're then so pre-primed for anxiety because they're always there and they're always tense. So it's, it's not hard for them to be constantly anxious. Somebody who's still in an unsafe situation do we say a place where their nervous system feels unsafe on a regular basis this can be a really challenging situation to do to work with um i have worked with it before and it's not easy because they're constantly re-triggered they never feel safe enough for long enough to really build the habits because they're constantly uh back to unsafe and and this is a real challenge um, I'm, I'm yet to have enough experience in this field mm. to, to know, um, in this particular example, um, to, 
to know more about that. But when it comes to, it still helps, but it's not as good, should we say. Um, so then you need a lot more breath work and you need to be able to find other ways to calm and obviously hopefully remove yourself from the situation. When it comes from a, a sort of maybe someone feels generally safe, but there are times or there's something from their past that still triggers them a bit. Obviously, talking therapies are really important in this area, but equally, again, we hold patterns and associations and lack of empowerment in us. So this is where we still work on on this and the anxiety generally can really improve. It can also help with things like um, when you're perimenopausal, menopausal, getting hot flushes. Again, it's not that it stops you having any symptoms. It's more that rather than letting your body run away with the anxiety and the and the the panic of you know if you've got a hot flush in a supermarket for example you know you're probably not going to feel super calm about that and yet if you've been trained through your breath to step in like you know and feel so much calmer then the likelihood is that isn't going to be so bad and i have had examples where um a friend of mine actually, and she had she had early um, perimenopause um, through treatment, and she very much did sweat out, like absolutely just soak her clothes in a supermarket, and obviously was upset about this. Posted online, and I just said like, "This is what we're going to do," and I sort of sent her through an audio for her to try, so she could actually start to train the the concept. And she used it really proactively, and she was like, "I've managed to, as soon as the hot flushes come, I've managed to stop it sweating out." Mm-hmm. Um, just with controlling her breath and knowing that she felt empowered. So so this is where breath work comes in more so, but you still need to retrain the habits as well. She had the habits a bit better, not perfect maybe, but she wasn't as bad as many, but she just didn't have this empowerment piece. For some people, it's about just getting away from that upper chest and building it gradually. Um, the, the exciting ones, though, are the panic attack end because that's quite extreme. And... Um, it's not uncommon for me to meet someone, maybe even have like one session or a workshop or something with them, teach them about this, make them aware, make them feel empowered. And I hear from them like two weeks later being like, I haven't actually had any panic attacks now. I'm usually having sort of the two a day or three a week or, right. you know, and this can be really incredible because yes, there can still be mental triggers. There's still work they need to do. Maybe they still maybe should go through speaking therapies, but they finally have something they can do and they're aware early enough and they're starting to change that. And I think that's a big one. We just, we just never, we never feel like we've got that. Yeah, that's, that's great. I mean, that shows how breath work goes beyond just, um, breathing issues that we spoke about, but also goes into really mental and, and nervous system issues. Like just, just to, I mean, for one example, that, if you take a breath in, your heart rate slightly goes up. And if you take a breath out, your heart rate slightly goes down. So your breath has a, an impact on your nervous system and your nervous system has an impact on your breath. So you've got these kind of reciprocal innovation. And that's why I had, had a f- good feeling that you would see improvements on things, you know, like stress, anxiety and and those types of things. Because if you, yeah, if you, if you can have better breathing patterns, um I, you would expect it would at least have an impact even if you're not getting you know the whole of it but yeah, yeah sounds like yeah. i mean it's sort of a, a typical like what i call a, a normal client for me would be someone like let's say a, a business owner um let's say they're male they've got a kid they've got um, a wife they've got a um uh, you know a sport that they do they've got about two other hobbies on the side they are maxed out like they love being busy and doing all these things but they you know they sort of it's quite intense and and they've, and they've had periods of time where they feel anxious or stressed. Maybe they've been on medication at one point, that sort of thing. This is quite a typical example of somebody today. <laughs> um, and this could be male or female, but I'm just using a male example here. And in this scenario, it's quite likely that they've never really been in a scenario where people are into breath or yoga or whatever, potentially if they're male in this particular example as well. But they're into their sport. They like to optimize. They do struggle with anxiety and stress, but, you know, nothing was really bad enough until they then sort of thought, hey, you know what? Like, I've seen you on LinkedIn. I've heard about it. Like, I'm actually intrigued of what, you know, I've watched you for six months. (laughs) I'm now at this point where I'm like, actually, I'd like to know a bit more. And this is where we get feedback like, I just feel calmer. I feel like, I don't react as quickly, you know, to things at work. I feel like I'm more patient with my child, more patient with my wife. I feel like I'm sleeping better. 
or, you know, we work with things like staircases as triggers. So it's like, you know, I get this, this moment of calm every day when I do this particular trigger or whatever we're doing. So they get these, these things they've never had before. And the awareness is huge. And then they sort of start to say like, and I did my sport and I was able to recover quicker and get back in it. And I felt in the zone. I didn't feel as tired as quickly. I felt like I recovered, you know, afterwards quicker as well. And it's, it's not so much about these huge, like, wow, life-changing, like one thing. It's, it's, you're a human and you have so many little areas of life that this touches from your sleep to your relationships to how quickly you respond to stuff to how stressed you feel to even oh my food used to sit heavy in my stomach and now because I'm calmer because I'm in the right side of my nervous system before I eat because I take that moment to calm my body before I expect it to digest bearing in mind it's that rest and digest side of the nervous system or the stress side if you're still on your stress side you're not going to be digesting so it, it's not complicated to once you understand the basics of it to go actually you know a little bit of awareness a little bit of conscious manipulation when needed to just bring myself back down but on a regular basis throughout the day because the training is there the actual you generally you're doing it better anyway after a few weeks but in the first point that's really like you've got to be quite conscious on it and then you just need to check in that's all we do need to do is be like how am i feeling oh i just feel a little not quite ready to digest i'm just gonna you know calm my breathing down while i'm making my sandwich and then i'll be ready to eat my sandwich you know things like that and we just don't necessarily think how important it is to just check in adjust but also to recognize what's going on you know we how can we do that if we've never learnt it if we've never either been shown or just worked it out um over time then this is this is it it's, it's not all amazing you know i've stopped having 15 panic attacks a day kind of scenario it's it's usually just actually i just feel better you know thank you just life is more enjoyable now uh, or i don't feel like i need to be on my medication anymore for anxiety yeah yeah i, I would struggle to imagine how particularly if someone has really bad breathing patterns that they wouldn't feel something <laughs> you know feel, feel better um we've spoke about some great stuff there i what would you say is if there is the most important thing we haven't spoken about yet Ooh, um that's a very good question Well, we've talked about just to recap over a couple of things so I can kind of make sure. So we've talked, spoken about tongue position. Tongue is absolutely key. So anybody looking to retrain their breathing habits, don't expect yourself to remember that you're nose breathing 20,000 times a day. You have to train your tongue. And that's why that video on, on the Link Breathing website is there because you go there four minutes in, you have all the stuff you need to know. Within about three days, you can train your tongue. Kind of, kind of amazing. And once your tongue is trained and it's in its space, a bit like putting a puppy back into its basket, <laughs> one, you've trained the strength of it, but you've also trained the position and you've also trained your awareness at the same time. So it's like a incredible triple whammy there. This is the first phase. And then it's getting comfortable with just nose breathing in general, whenever possible. Even if you've never thought you could, believe you can and try for as long as you can. And if you can't for the full length of time, stop. Sometimes people can feel a little dizzy. Sometimes they can feel a little um, bit odd. And again, just don't do this while they're doing anything extreme like driving or staircases, but, you know, take it gently bit by bit. But it's all about that building. People need to learn that it is normal, it is safe, but you will have this, this barrier of the CO2 tolerance to allow for that to kind of gradually move as you improve habits. Um, the other thing we talked about was the D spot. So the posture of the D spot is really important. Um, and this spot, I really want people to be, you know, understanding it and feeling that they can use it. Um, some people struggle with that, so they can reach out if they're kind of like, I get it, but I don't get it. If that makes sense. Um, and, and we talk about, um, the expansion. So I call this the R spot. So that's my, my other coinage. <laughs> so on the side, so as you expand into the side, you can really feel, um, sideways rather than just sort of like tilting into the front. Um, you should also feel it right around the back as well. So this is when we're at rest, we should be still with the breath. So it should be calm, quiet, and minimal. When we're um, exercising, it should still be slower than we think, but it should be much more expanded. And again, ideally through the nose, but sometimes we have to work towards the nose. And if we are trying to do that, we go through the nose as long as we can. We dump through the mouth. 
and then we go back to the nose. Mm. So these are really crucial little areas that we we don't have to go like straight in on <laughs> trying to nose breathe and like we've got to we've got to pace ourselves and we've got to gradually build up. We we start as a human and then we go into the what performance angles we're looking to do. Um, these are the major areas that I want to want to cover. Um, I think the big ones as well are just knowing that it is perception issues. You know, what hopefully what people have learned today is that there's quite a lot they didn't know. It's actually, some of it is opposite to what they've just heard and and getting used to the fact that maybe they just have had it wrong <laughs> with years and, and it's not necessarily their fault, um, but to now know there is something positive that they can do and that's a really important one. Um, and then feeling that they can actually check in so we can even put our own hands on our bodies and notice just where the breath is going. And this is what I do as part of our as full assessment I do, um, but feeling like, where is it going? And what can I feel? And if you obviously if you not don't know, obviously reach out. But otherwise, you can feel quite a lot just from placing your hands and taking the time to do so. And then you can start to change it gradually, which is really good. So I think we've covered quite a lot today. Yeah, um, I know we've tra- covered a bit of the child side of things. Mm-hmm. Um, if somebody is looking for more information on the child side, which is quite important, um, they should check out Instagram and go to the orthodontic specialist. Um, so this is Dr. Stefan Decker. Um, he is sort of a leading orthodontist in the space and actually training people from all around the world, um, but is also part of the groups that are getting together to try and change this in in in, in this country as well. Um, but he has really helpful educational stuff about, you know, the link between ear infections and teeth grinding and poor sleep and ADHD style symptoms and et cetera that can be impacted by sleep quality through breathing and function. And so he helps bring it all together uh, from a breathing to orthodontics point of view. And he does do assessments for young young kids um, and also uh, does do um, orthodontics for them as well and then can obviously signpost elsewhere if necessary. Yeah, brilliant. I'll, and I'll put the the link in the description. And I also noticed that you you have a book. And when I first saw, saw the book, I thought, what, why is it that you only got a book on children and parents? I thought, ah, based on what you said today, I think that makes a lot of sense. Yes, so, and I, I'm feeling a bit silly now because I totally meant to bring you a copy and I totally forgot, oh, really? but I answered uh, anyone. Yeah, okay. um, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, so yes, yeah, so I, I wrote a book called Rose Loses Her Nose yeah. um, and it's a children's book, but it's actually a Trojan horse for adult education. So it's not that it's not for the child, it is for the child. But I realise that there are a lot of people who are um, needing to hear certain information, but don't necessarily feel ready to hear it. So you might come across this in, in your world as well, that maybe you've got like a sibling or something and you might say, oh, you know, this thing about you that I know of that you could do that would help you. And they're like, la, 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 la. So um, even though we're in our families that we feel we can help, sometimes it's not always well received. So I've realized that we needed a a tool (laughs) that we could use for that. We also have, um, there's a a wonderful uh, book out there called Breath by James Nestor. So if you haven't read it, do, but anybody else, uh, obviously read read it. But it is obviously a thick adult book. It is an incredible book. He's written the book that I now don't need to. However, I did think about writing another one. I thought, you know what? If somebody gives somebody his book, there's a chance they'll read it. There's a very high chance it'll end up on the shelf for quite a long time until another seven people have told them to read that book and eventually they'll take it off the shelf and read it, by which point their child's already grown up and, you know, whatever else. This one is you give it to a child like an uncle or aunt or grandparent or friend or whatever gives it to the child the parent then reads it at bedtime they then learn the education the child learns the education the parent then realizes they're actually not breathing well themselves and in the back of it it teaches the n spot the d spot and the r spots so they can actually do it with the child read the storyline because everyone loves a story we all learn from a story it's not like aimed at a specific age the kids in it are four six and eight so it's kind of like spread age you could read it to a 12 year old. They'd find it a bit babyish, but still everyone loves a story. So it's a bit of a, you know, embrace it. Uh, but it's ideal from a baby through, they just read it and read it again and read it again and read it. It becomes like a family favorite where they just do it and then they do the exercise at the back. But hopefully the parent realizes that they can change theirs. And the key thing about kids is kids don't just do what you tell them. They do what you do. Parents need to retrain their own breathing habits to help their kids retrain theirs. One, because they otherwise don't understand what's going on and how it feels, but also they will watch you and they will copy you. Mm. Yeah, that makes sense. And um, yeah, as you were saying earlier, 
it, if you can sort the problem out earlier, it's then going to be way more beneficial. And I imagine that it, I can imagine you also wrote that book because you wish you read that book when you were seven, right? That's exactly it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, when I was seven and my nose felt too small, if I'd read that book, I'd have tried to nose breathe. Yeah. And then I'd have trained my tongue because it told me in the back where to put my tongue and that I didn't know that was even a thing and I'd have known not to go into the upper chest and to try for my diaphragm on the D spot and I've known when I exercise where to go no one ever told me those things mm. it's not that complicated no. um but what I think the thing that really is important is we've tried to oversimplify breathing in the past or tried to simplify but by saying belly breathing someone felt they were getting the the right way of simplifying that because oh you know lie on the floor and put a book on your belly and if it moves up that's a bit too generic for my liking when you lie down there is a little bit more blending between the areas of your d-spot and your belly button but there is a specific feeling and if it is coming from there or coming from there with a book you can't really tell but with your hands and a spot you can so this is why i feel like we need to simplify we also need to make it fun and accessible and all these other things. But we don't want to oversimplify to the point where it's misinterpreted. And that's what I've tried to change in this industry. It's People have been doing a great job about the breathwork side, but I don't think we've necessarily got there yet on, on this breeding education. And I think these spots, the D spot and the N spot and the R spot help with just getting to the right spot, but particularly the D spot. I think that is the, the biggest game changer recently. Yeah, and you articulate that really well. So I think by explaining it well, it helps obviously people to understand. Um, just wanted to read you something. I was just going over your Instagram and uh, I thought <laughs> yeah. this was a really nice, I think it was uh, from my workshop. Maybe it was the Paris one, but one of the, maybe you might recognize it. it. says, Jane is a rare find, someone with a true passion and personal mission to share knowledge that has transformed her own life. I thought it was really nice. Amazing. Who was it that said yeah. that one? I don't know. Oh. <laughs> do you remember it? I I do remember it, but I can't remember who said it. Yeah, I thought that was nice. It wasn't too long ago. It was a relatively recent post. But um, yeah, and, and I can completely relate to that. I mean, this is literally the first time we've met. Um, I, I kind of seen you uh, on videos on, in 2D. It's nice to see you in 3D. And thank you so much for making the, the effort to come down because... Um, yeah, I know that's uh, it takes time out of your day. And I know that if someone's watched this to this point, they're going to get a lot of value, um, just like I have. And I know that I'm going to change quite a lot of what I do, as well as hopefully being able to help my patients better. And I'm pretty sure I'm going to probably be looking at your masterclass course because I think that's going to be very helpful. Um, I'd love to read that book um, when I get a chance. So thank you so much, Jane. Well, thank you for having me and thank you for helping me spread this education. It's, it's really important. And, you know, obviously I can work with a certain number of people, but there, everybody else just needs to know to get on with it and hopefully be curious uh, about the empowerment of their own bodies. So thank you. Yeah. Um, and, and of course, if someone wants to find you, we'll put some links in the description. Um you have a website and LinkedIn, you're quite active on it, aren't you? Yeah. So generally uh, my website is linkbreathing.co.uk. Um, I'm most active on LinkedIn under Jane Tarrant. I've got a little microphone and nose in my thing at the moment. So you can generally tell which one is me. Um, and otherwise I'm on Instagram at linkbreathing. So those are the main ones that I sort of I'm on. Um, and yeah, you know, people, if people want support, it's there. You know, I do do these assessments. I do have an online course, which is accessible and has a payment plan. Otherwise it's more of a one-to-one, -one, it's more premium, et cetera, or, or, you know, the football teams or whoever. So we're all corporates. So it's kind of like, I basically try to help everyone how I can. And I've tried to create a model that allows me to do so without me burning out um, or running out of time. So yeah, hopefully it's there, but I, I just, I really want people to give it a go, see how far they get. If they need help, ask for it. If they don't and they can do it themselves, wonderful. You know, that's how I did it initially. And I love I love giving things a go before I'm willing to pay for them. But yes. sometimes there comes a time when we just need a bit of help. Yeah, and you don't know until you try. Yeah, thanks, Jane. <laughs>